let me just test the sound here so that we have a, that the sound is working correctly. Well. Okay, so welcome to a, a new semester and welcome to uh, uh, this specific course. So I, my name is, as you can see down here from the list of teachers, I'm the guy with this kind of strange name here. And the other gang uh, of teachers are TAs, which you will meet at the lab. Actually, one of them is here. Ida is just in the background there. You can see her there. And uh, some of you have already met Ida. So we had the uh, lab sessions yesterday and today. And these lab sessions were meant more as a kind of uh, getting started with the software and see where you find the material and how to handle the material and what kind of things you need to have installed. I'm actually going, and I hope those of you who were attended the lab sessions don't get offended if I repeat some of the things because not everybody was there. Uh, so I'm going to repeat some of the messages. This is a very much a lab based course. So being at the lab is actually where the essential things take place. Uh, but hopefully I won't, um, I won't bore you too much uh, in the lectures as well. And as I said, the lectures will be recorded. Uh, I actually wanted to have this as a kind of flipped classroom with more active learning, but that's pretty difficult with the audience which we have here. So this is a pretty, I mean, from a pedagogical point of view is a pretty old fashioned auditorium, which for anything with active learning is basically useless. Let's see. Okay, I shouldn't rant down about these things. Okay, so what I want to give you in the very beginning is just a quick overview where you find the material. So one of the things which we typically recommend is that you uh, have installed a software, a version control software like Git, because then you can pull down everything and uh, use the teaching material as your own teaching material. So you can take my lecture notes, my Jupyter notebooks, and just use them as starting point for developing uh, your own lecture notes. So all everything here, nothing is behind walls. Everything is fully open. So you can actually download everything and just use it. So please do that. The, uh, uh, as you can see here, there's a link to the, uh, uh, the um, I, I will not be answering, by the way, I will not be answering in the chat while I teach. So if somebody here is online with Zoom and wants to answer other people asking questions in the Zoom session, uh, please do that. But I won't be able to write on, on the whiteboard, uh, talk, and yeah. I hope you can forgive me for those of you online. I won't be able to follow the chat before we come to the breaks. So the... Um, uh, the material, uh, you will find things like the schedule here. And the in the schedule here, you will find the, the Zoom link to the lectures. We're going to use the same link all the time. Uh, you will find reading suggestions. And for those of you who are familiar with UIO, you know that you can subscribe to these activities. So in case there's a change in lecture hall or things happen, uh, you will always get a text. So in case... Uh, the university, uh, or maybe happen, it happens that we close down or whatever, you will always get a text message. So if you haven't done that, this is a very nice feature. So you will find this information, uh, but you will also get uh, emails. Uh, so I know that not everybody uh, was registered on Canvas, but I hope that by the end of the week, this will... Uh, everybody will be registered on Canvas. So I send weekly mails to everybody and uh, the weekly mails will contain the plans for the week, where you find different things, uh, reading assignments. So the textbooks which I've uh, linked up to, they uh, uh, contain material if you want to deepen, uh, go beyond what I've put in the lecture slides. So remember now that the lecture is actually more a kind of session where you get the overarching views, the motivation for why we do what we do, and some basic central messages. And then uh, many of the nitty gritty details, uh, often things which we don't have time to do in the lectures, we will do them sometimes in the lab. 
but then the textbook can uh, be helpful in you getting a deeper insight about many of the methods. So it's always this mix, uh, you having a book which you can uh, dive into at your own pace, and then the lectures which give you the basic overview. Now, feel free to interrupt me with questions whenever you want. Don't be, uh, don't be shy. The, uh, uh, this is the schedule which you find here. And then the uh, basic, basically all the material is actually at the GitHub site of the course. And this contains uh, links to uh, uh, the weekly schedules, uh, textbooks and everything. So I just invite you to take a look here at uh, what, is, what is here. Uh, we have three projects. Uh, I'm going to repeat some of this basic message in the beginning. So the first lecture today is more uh, a little bit overview and getting started with machine learning and explaining the layout of uh, what we are going to do and why we do what we do. And then uh, we are going to dive into uh, what I normally use to call low level machine learning, which is basically linear regression, uh, which many of you have met in linear algebra as least squares at least the simplest form of linear regression. So the, uh, uh, the, perhaps one of the things which is more interesting here is actually the Jupyter book, which you find here. So this contains basically an extended version of my lectures with uh, some more text, which is a little bit dangerous when you venture into writing more stuff. The, um, it contains a teaching schedule and in this teaching schedule, you will also find the videos of the lectures. So I, after the lectures, I normally post the uh, video, but then I grind it through YouTube because YouTube has actually improved its machine learning uh, methods applied to text recognition. But it takes some 10 to 12 hours to digest a two hour lecture, but then it gives subtitles. So the day after you will find a link to the uh, lecture with subtitles. And uh, I tend to speak this kind of Latinized English. So if you are in doubt with some words, I mean, if you, if you uh, uh, know how to use the subtitle version of YouTube, you can actually uh, translate the English text to Chinese, Arabic. And so in case you are, uh, I mean, you feel less knowledgeable about some words in English, feel free to uh, use this uh, translation feature. It's actually excellent. And so the, the subtitles will typically pop up the day after. And hopefully that will help people with hearing impairments. That's also a service to those of you who are getting like me here, worse and worse. I should actually have a hearing aid, but then you have vanity. Not vanity, I shouldn't say that. Just, no, it's just vanity, just laziness. So if you ask questions in the back, I mean, I may actually stand like this. So raise your voice sometimes. I'll let you know if I don't hear you. And if I just say something totally, totally wrong as, as an answer, then you've understood that I didn't hear you well. Okay. So you will find the, uh, uh, the lecture notes here. So the, uh, it has a searching possibility. You cannot run the Jupyter books here. Uh, I actually, the way I set it up is that it produces the output. However, if you then go back to this link, this is where you will find the weekly material. So I will put a link in the mails which I send you to the weekly material, but I will also give you a, a link to the uh, more in-depth material, which you can look at at your own pace. Uh, this is exactly the same, just different formats. So in the lectures, I will tend to use the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, sometimes I just use the slides. So let's dive into the slides here, right? And just get started. So you have probably guessed that we are beginning now. So you are here and that means that you've read the schedule properly. So we're uh, gonna do a presentation, a little bit of aims and content, and then we're gonna start uh, on simple linear regression. And uh, on Friday, we continue with linear regression. And we're going to go through the mathematics of linear regression. By the way, guys, I mean, you in the back, can you hear well? No problems? Okay. So this is about some practicalities. You can find reading recommendations. 
Uh, one of the problems with many of the machine learning texts is that they tend to either be pretty soft on mathematics and more on applications. So this textbook by Aurelien Geron is actually uh, an example of that. That's an excellent textbook. It contains a lot of code. I've actually stolen examples from that and been inspired by it. This is actually a very good textbook if you're looking at applications. And it has a lot of examples. Then we have the classic textbook by Hasty et al. Uh, this is a textbook which often, in a, when you read it, it, it I mean, it uh, transpires that you, you should know a little bit more statistics. So, but it doesn't have so many derivations, but it gives you a very good overview of a statistical data analysis. Then we have the book by Bishop, which is also a pretty good one. It contains more derivations. And then if you want to have the overview of deep learning, this is a book written by some of the really the big experts and people who have been developing uh, many important algorithms. And that textbook can be uh, uh, accessed uh, online. Every PDF, uh, every chapter has a PDF file, which you can download. And it's a very good read. Uh, it's, uh, it's good on motivation. It's a little bit perhaps lax on some of the mathematics, uh, but then you can compensate with both lectures and this book by Bishop as well. So I will try to guide you if there's mathematics, if you're interested in the mathematics of deep learning, there are actually many good textbooks, which I can uh, give you as references. Uh, by the way, the uh, if you go into this link here, uh, this doc folder, if you go into the pop folder, you will find the published uh, lecture notes. So these are week 34 where we are now, that's all the slides. Uh, if you want the, uh, the, uh, the source file for all the lecture notes, you can go to the source file folder. Then there is a, as I said, during the lab session, there's a black magic folder here. And this is where by some accident, many textbooks just end up, I don't know why they just get attracted there. You can actually download many of these textbooks if you if you go to the uh, if you on a university IP number, and then you can actually download these textbooks. Uh, if this is a Springer text, so all Springer texts from two thousand and eight and on, you can actually download them for free if you're on a university IP number. So you will get the PDF or a book which you can read on, uh, let's say, on your. On your favorite reader on the on your tablet. So the Springer text, but also many other publishers, they do actually have uh, because they sell a bundle of uh, journals and uh, textbooks, and in that subscription, the university allows you to download textbook as well. So if you are a little bit unfamiliar with that, so this is just a kind since we are now just in this overview session. If you look down here, you will find a, uh, a uh, the link, for instance, if you look at Hasty's textbook, you will get you will be directed to this link and you can download the PDF immediately. So this is an extremely useful uh, uh, feature. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, to the slides here. Can you guys read well? Is the are the fonts okay? Light, okay. No problems in the back there. Okay. The, um, yeah, there's a Zoom link and we will, uh, for those of you who cannot attend in person and uh, would like to attend online, we do that. But the lecture is also recorded. So you can always look back at what we went through. And if you're like me with an attention span of roughly 10 minutes, then I start daydreaming, then it's always good to actually look back at things. So we have uh, uh, some weekly exercises when we're not working on the projects. So this is a very project driven course, right? So being at the lab, I mean, is essential, okay? So every, the lectures, I mean, the theory which we develop and teach uh, is linked to many of the implementations which we're going to do in, in in, in the projects. So we have three projects. Uh, there's no final exam. And the last project, as I told those of you who came to the lab sessions, 
The last project is a project where we um, uh, have, have an open-ended uh, uh, option for you. Uh, if you have data set you want to explore using the methods we have been uh, uh, discussing during the semester, you can actually propose uh, other data sets. You can do that with every project. If you find the vanilla data, which I present as a little bit boring, and keep in mind also that this is a course which uh, has uh, participants from uh, the whole College of Natural Science. It has people from uh, the humanities and people from the social sciences. So that means that uh, when I present, uh, let's say a physics example, this may not be so relevant. I am a physicist. And uh, uh, you should feel free to uh, replace some of my data, the data which I present with uh, uh, data which are more relevant to your own work. Uh, we've had many cases where people have been collaborating, where they worked on data, which even ended up in publications, the last project, or became important parts of a PhD or a Master of Science thesis. We also encourage you to team up uh, for the project work. I mean, two to three people are, uh, is, a, is a, I would say, an optimal number of people. If you are pretty familiar and confident in uh, a group of people you can easily be four. We've had many groups of four people. And uh, as I said to those of you who attended the labs, I mean, it's always good to collaborate because one of you may be an expert in mathematics. One of you may be a domain expert. One of you may be a computational wizard or somebody may be like me, just good at making coffee. So you need people who do that in lab sessions also or just come with uh, lame jobs. Okay. So the, uh, uh, the final project is also a project where we uh, uh, want to uh, uh, you to explore, uh, let's say, own data sets. And we also have had a workshop towards the end of the semester where people present their proposals for project number three. And that's extremely useful because sometimes uh, people may say, oh, that was an interesting data set. I would like to join that group. And that's fully possible. When you hand in the projects, this is something you can hand in as a group. You will obviously then get the same score. You can collaborate as a group and just hand in an individual project. Then it could happen that you would get different scores. So this is very much up to you guys. Maximum flexibility, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So we have a, uh, a, I'm gonna send you an email because one of you has created a uh, student-driven Slack channel. Now I cannot announce this properly because the this will be inside hidden in the slides because this breaks with the GDPR rules. So that means that uh, uh, we, we also use another communication channel, which is called Piazza, but Piazza refuses to tell where they send the data. And you can get a lot of publicity, which perhaps is unwanted in your mailbox. So some of these popular communication platforms, we cannot use them. So Slack, we have a Slack channel. I'm gonna send you the link to the one which I got from one of you. And you can join those for discussions about the projects. But the, uh, you will not see me putting this on the official web page. But you will get as an email, and I hope you don't get offended if you get an email about something which breaks the GDPR rules. The Canvas is the official communication channel. So we have three compulsory projects. Uh, we uh, uh, strive towards sending you feedback on the first project. Uh, before you hand in the second one, and same with the third one. Uh, these are graded. And uh, the idea is that uh, these projects uh, should function or should look like a scientific report. Many of you come from uh, departments and bachelor programs where you've never written a scientific report. So this side of the, the course is actually a kind of training, which is very useful when you are going to write, many of you, your master thesis. Because your master thesis or a scientific report, technical report, a PhD, they have essentially the same structure. 
So when you've gone through the drill here three times, uh, starting with your master thesis may be a little bit easier to see how you should structure it. So the, um, uh, the last, as I said, the last project, we try to have a post, we, we actually once had a poster session, but since it often gets close to the winter break or next some period, it's been a little bit difficult, but we like to have a small workshop where people present uh, the final project. And that's always been very useful. Uh, we use uh, Python essentially throughout the course, but if you want to program in Julia, um, feel free to do that. Julia has lot, lot is an emerging language. It has uh, many things which are uh, which I like. It has nice uh, uh, machine learning libraries uh, and features. It has uh, uh, you have R if you want to write your codes in R. So R is a, a statistics tool which is very popular but it's a little bit weaker on deep learning. So we've had people who started to write in R, but then when it came to convolutional neural networks, I mean, uh, there was no way you could use R. But you should feel free to uh, uh, use the software you are familiar with. Uh, the, uh, uh, we are agnostic when it comes to uh, operating systems, so you can use whatever operating system you prefer. So this is very much up to you. The um, uh, source codes and everything for lectures, they can be found at the webpage for the course. Uh, this is the list of teachers. Uh, just send me an email if you, if you wish to meet. So this is a tentative schedule. So I said tentative because uh, I need feedback from you guys. In case there are crashes with exams or things like that, and I tend to have a, uh, how to say, a lax attitude to deadline. So I am a firm believer in procrastination. Procrastination actually increases my creativity. Actually, I'm at my most creative when I procrastinate. But I, I'm, not, I'm not urging you to procrastinate. So keep the deadlines, but in case something happens, you're always a little bit flexible, okay? The deadlines are for your planning, okay? So just let me know, shoot me an email in case some of the deadlines are uh, on conflict with exams. So in particular, the last one, because we tend to have the, uh, the final one around the, same, the first half or towards the end of December, now the middle of December. And we use Canvas. And since we uh, encourage people to use uh, Git and repositories like GitHub or GitLab and so on, what Socrates is actually doing is sending the link to your repository. And that should contain the report of the PDF or a Word document or whatever, what's your favorite format. And then it should have the program file so we can actually run things and see that things are running correctly. And then obviously tests of the uh, your code so that you can reproduce what you have done. So having things on a repository like GitLab or GitHub or similar thing allows you to reproduce the data later, half a year later when you're running your code, you may have forgotten what the code was doing, if you like me. And it also allows us to check that you're producing what you're supposed to produce. Any questions for sure? It seems we have some background noise here in the. Uh, so, for those of you online, there's somebody who would need to unmute herself or himself. Or maybe it's just some noise from my laptop. I don't know. Okay. Good. So, the. Uh, uh, I'm just not going to repeat that. I'm not going to say this. Uh, but this is something which, uh, so this slide is a little bit dense. I'm not going to go through everything here. So I assume you all can read. And uh, uh, this is something I actually want to take a look at when the course is over. So we do have some learning outcomes. So towards the end of November or December, when you're done, Take a look back at the learning outcomes and see if we have been able to live up to the learning outcomes. So this is something I just invite you to take a look at. 
uh, I'm not going to discuss this now. But what I wanted to start with uh, is a little bit about the, uh, uh, so not about these tools and things like that, uh, but I wanted to say uh, a little bit about the uh, machine learning philosophy. So uh, the way we are going to teach this course falls very much into what has been called traditional machine learning. So this kind of uh, tradition is a little bit artificial, at least the way I see it. But the way you can think of it, the traditional approach to machine learning uh, has been based on what in statistics is called a frequent fixed approach. Is anyone familiar with that? So you would have the frequency of the data, which you would use then to determine a probability distribution. But in many machine learning applications, you're not that interested in getting a probability distribution for the events you should have. You're often interested in making a fit and using that fit to make a prediction. So prediction is an important word. So you make a fit to data, and then if you believe in your fit, you would use Apple to make predictions for what has not been observed. So that's one thing. Another thing is correlation in the data. So when you make a fit, you would like to get a deeper understanding of your data. So maybe your fit reveals some correlation in the data. So suppose there are features in your data which are strongly correlated, then there are other features which are less correlated. So if you're selling a house, you know that the, uh, uh, the size of the house matches for the price. So you could clearly say that uh, the price on the market for a house is correlated with uh, the size of the house, the number of rooms and so on. Uh, it's probably correlated with where you live, unfortunately, and so on and so on. Then there may be other things uh, whether uh, other features which are less important. So when you make a fit uh, and you analyze the data, you're often interested in things like correlations and being able to make predictions. That has been kind of way the standard machine learning approach. Then we have something which is called Bayesian statistics. Has anyone heard of that here? So Bayesian statistics is more uh, you having a belief that the data follow a certain distribution, and then uh, you are able to extract a probability distribution for your data. Now, for me as a physicist, I want both of these sides. I want to do predictions, I want to do correlations, but I also want a probability distribution. And that's a very important reason. Because when you have a probability distribution, you can calculate things like the standard error. So you can actually provide an error of the estimate. But with a probability distribution, you can also deal with proportion. A leads to B with a certain probability. So uh, when traditionally in statistics, there's often been in statistical data analysis, there's been two branches, one the frequency one, and then the Bayesian one. Uh, when you focus on something different things, but this kind of division is a little bit artificial. You would find textbooks which emphasize this division. Uh, in this course, we are going to pay more attention to the prediction and correlation part, but we will talk upon a statistical interpretation. So, like linear regression, which I call a low level machine learning uh, approach, is actually you can derive everything using linear algebra. But you can also derive everything, assuming that the events are distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. So you can derive exactly the same equation from a statistical point of view, but also from a plain linear algebra. And linear regression is the entry point to our statistical analysis of the data and machine learning. Uh, is a, uh, it contains a set of methods and algorithms which uh, allow us to gain a deeper insight about both the statistics and also the standard machine learning way of thinking. 
So it allows us to tax money goes with uh, respect to manually access, which become more complicated when we go to deep learning. Learning. So linear regression, for instance, has allowed us to expand. When you look at least uh, the standard order in each square, it allows us to extract analytical expression for the variance of the parameters of the model. And that's extremely new. And it allows us to give up uh, this kind of insight where we fail with both picking something but also thinking about a statistical analysis. <coughs> but this chart is going to be, uh, we're going to have less focus on that. And if you're interested, please attend your methods because we do have excellent focus at university on the reason analysis, the reason machine learning, that's actually a hot topic, and many, many other things. So when we uh, look at machine learning, uh, there are uh, some basic things. So this course deals a lot uh, with supervised learning. So supervised learning means that uh, somebody has labeled your data. And that's the typical entry point and the most common case. However, in many cases, you may have uh, terabytes or petabytes of data. And then you need to deal with something which is called unsupervised learning. So actually to be able to classify events. So if you're running an experiment at CERN, uh, CERN produces, if I'm not totally wrong, per second, the LHC, I think it produces in the order petabyte data per seconds, and these are squeezed down to gigabytes. So there's a data compression already per second. An experiment at CERN runs up to a year. Then you can do the math and see how many gigabytes they want to produce. Actually, CERN closes in the winter because that's when electricity bills soar and little maintenance. What's so, uh, supervised and unsupervised learning are the methods we will touch upon. And uh, we are going to look at methods, some, some methods to deal with also unsupervised learning. Uh, but supervised learning is going to be the, uh, how to say, the, the main emphasis. The uh, type yes. of problems we deal with uh, are normally classified. So you would typically be able to want to classify whether somebody is uh, sick or not. So that's a typical binary problem. Yes, no problem. These are the simplest classification problems. And we want to make a model to classify the data and to make predictions based on the model. Martin? We have uh, what is normally called regression. And regression, uh, you can translate that into you wanting to make a fit. Oh, there a... Oops, could you please just switch off? Uh, I'm asking a question. Yeah, but we... When, when you step away from the computer, it's hard to, for us to hear you. Okay, just so I'm, I'm going to stay closer to the computer. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to change my... Maybe I'm going to do this. You online? Can you hear me better now? It was fine, but if you step away, it's hard. But you can try stepping yeah. away, talking. Yeah, but but now I have the uh, I have a headset, so I can actually step away a little bit, and okay. you should be That's able to okay hear now. me now. Yes. Now it's better, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the. Uh, uh, the next uh, type of problem which we are dealing with then is regression problems. And that means simply us having to fit a function here. And then we have different ways of doing that. And the way we, the first one we're going to start with is actually linear regression. And that means finding a functional relationship between input data and a set of reference data sets. We also have clustering, which we will cover uh, towards the end of the semester with data divided into groups and with certain common traits without knowing the groups beforehand. This is a very common technique if you're analyzing experimental data and you have terabytes or petabytes of data, then you can actually cluster out those data which you want to analyze with more traditional analysis methods. Because when you produce this amount of data, so like I was involved in a data analysis of an experiment in the US, and in that experiment, we produce something like close to petabytes of data. And there's no way you can just sit and go through every individual data point with the traditional methods. 
that would just be a waste of time. And then you would do a pre-classification and then reduce the size of your problem. And then when you've reduced the size of the problem, use traditional methods, analysis tools. So you can view machine learning as a way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So for me, uh, doing quantum physics, I am obsessed with dimensionality problems. That's uh, what really bothers me on a daily basis. So any method which I can use to reduce the dimensionality of the problem is of interest. And machine learning, you can actually think of machine learning as a way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. That's one way of thinking of it. So the, uh, there are three main topics, and I'm going to repeat this again and again. So the first ingredient is your data set. And this data set contains typically input data and output data. That's the first element, whatever you make, you need data. So whether you're doing unsupervised or supervised learning, you need to have some data. So in the beginning, in many of the projects here, we're actually gonna deal with some kind of vanilla data. So pretty simple data, actually structuring data, reading data uh, from experiments and so on can actually be pretty difficult. In this course, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis here is on you having some data file which is ready for machine learning algorithms and then focusing on the machine learning aspect. So this is the first ingredient and this can be labeled or unlabeled. Then the second is actually your model. So this is where you have to come up with all your insights about the problem. So you need to make a model, okay? There is, you can have a perfect fit of the data, but the model may be meaningless. You can have a crappy fit of the data, but the model may be very useful. So what is a good model is actually a very deep question. And all the deep questions, we are gonna skip them. So we will not address the problem, what is a good model? That's something which uh, depends very much on the specific discipline and on the kind of insights you have gained about the domain specific problems. Okay, but we uh, are going to guide you through different types of models which we can set up. So just keep this in mind. You have the data. Second ingredient is a model you make. Then when you have a model, you need to assess whether this is a good model or not. And that leads to you defining a function. And that function has a name in the literature. And some of you may have heard it already. Anyone mm -hmm. remembers? So you need to have a function by which you assess the quality of the model. Anyone who remembers that? Yep. The loss of cost function is, is a typical uh, example of such a name which you will find. If you go to fields like finance, it's called the risk function. Some people call the error function. It may change name from domain to domain, but it's normally called, we will normally call this the cost or the loss function. This is a function which depends on the parameters of your model and the data. And then when you have done that, when you have such a function, which you use to assess the quality of the model, then you need to optimize. And that's what is at the heart of every machine learning algorithm. It's an optimization problem. So that means that this function, which you try to use to assess the model, and if you think back, to what you did in linear algebra with the least, the, the ordinary least square method, then what you did evaluate was the mean squared error. We are going to bring up these equations after the break. So starting with the mean squared error, you actually take the derivative of that one because the mean squared error is going to depend on the uh, model which you have. And then taking the derivative with respect to the parameters of the model, you can then drive the gradient or the derivatives to zero and then you will find the optimal parameters of the model. So optimization is actually the, uh, the, at the real heart of uh, all machine learning algorithms, whether you're doing deep learning, convolution neural networks, or decision trees, random forests, you're going to 
do an optimization. And that means you having to calculate gradients. This function, which I mentioned, which you are using to assess the quality of the model, can be a nice convex function, which well behaved, or it can be an ugly multidimensional beast, which may not even have a global minimum or even a, a minimum. You don't know. They can have saddle points and can have maxima, it can have minima, and that's going to make it difficult to find the minimum of this function you want to assess, you use to assess the quality of the model of. Questions so far? Okay. So, so gradient methods, uh, this actually what comes in here. So I'm, as I said, I'm not going to read all this. There's much more stuff than I'm going to, to talk about. But I mentioned it a little bit about the frequentist and the Bayesian approach. And uh, what we are always torn about is this uh, uh, features like predictions, correlations, causations, and estimations of errors. To estimate errors is actually highly non-trivial. So in my field, which is theoretical quantum mechanics, uh, you will be surprised to see how many scientific papers which don't have an assessment of the errors of the models. So I'd say that 80 to 90% of the scientific papers do not have a proper error estimation. And in a certain sense, you could say that's a horrible use of taxpayers' monies if you cannot assess the error in your models. That's a big problem, and it's a non-trivial thing. So I'm going to leave some of the slides here, and you can actually look at it and think a little bit about these things. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about software in the labs and so on. So we typically recommend using Python. Uh, we have uh, different types of libraries. Uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, uh, much of this stuff here. But one thing I would like to mention, uh, Google has actually allows you to use uh, uh, the Google Colab. And you can actually run your Jupyter Notebooks there. You get access to GPUs and you can quickly speed up uh, your calculations. Uh, you should also think of using the uh, computational cluster we have at the University of Oslo. We actually have dedicated machine learning nodes. So just search for machine learning nodes, University of Oslo. And then you can apply for, for uh, computation time there and use them if you're interested. Google Colab is very easy to use. So that's a, it's a very good option. But if you're interested in using the uh, nodes which we have at the university, I mean, feel free to apply for uh, computer time there. So these are things which we discussed in the, in the, uh, in the during the lab sessions. Uh, I just wanted to remind some of you about it, for those of you who did not have the possibilities. So NumPy is a basic software, which we library, which we are going to use again and again. And then we have Pandas, which makes life very easy. And there are examples in the notes here which you can look up yourself. So I encourage you to take a look at it because next week when we start doing exercises, uh, using pandas and NumPy is going to be pretty, pretty useful. I'm going to show you some examples on how pandas actually makes life easier in reading data files. So I'm actually going to start with that after the break. Then uh, we are going to uh, also use uh, continuously something which is called autograd, automatic differentiation. So if you ask me about some of the most beautiful algorithms in mathematics, automatic differentiation is one of these. It allows you to compute derivatives to numerical precision. And autograd has been replaced by JAX, J-A-X, and uh, it allows you to efficiently calculate gradients with no pain, which is important. Because calculating gradients is really at the heart of all machine learning methods. So if you can use an algorithm and software like automatic differentiation, use it. Really use it. I really encourage you to use that. one. Then, uh, since we wish, uh, want you to have as much flexibility as possible, if you're familiar with uh, PyTorch, which was a library released by Facebook, feel free to use that one. Uh, our standard path uses scikit-learn as a library which has some of the basic methods. It doesn't contain uh, advanced deep learning methods. 
But then scikit-learn, I mean, the functionality there, and it has an excellent documentation, uh, works well. It interfaces well with TensorFlow, which was released by Google, and Keras, which is an API on top of TensorFlow. So when we get to the end of the course and you want to use advanced deep learning methods, uh, without going through the hassle of programming everything in TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, Keras gives you a very user-friendly interface. And we normally recommend using that one because you have to strike a balance between how much time you want to use here. And then you can choose whether you want to use which kind of programming language. We actually had people who wrote all projects in Fortran, actually object-oriented Fortran. So this is very much up to you. So we, I'm, we are not going to go through this now, but we, after the break, uh, I wanted to show you a quick example on the usage of pandas and how we can use this software. And then we are going to start with the mathematics of linear regression so that we can demystify what libraries like scikit-learn is using. So some of you will have seen this in the lab sessions and some of you may not have seen it. So I apologize for those of you who saw some of this in the lab sessions. I propose we take a break, uh, just stretch legs, be back at quarter past the hour. Feel free to come here and ask questions. Uh, if you have questions, things which are unclear, let me know. Okay, for those of you online, I'm gonna put the recording on pause and I hope you could hear me better now, eh? Okay, so the um, thing which I wanted to do in this lecture is one, to give you a kind of teaser of how we can use, and some of you have actually seen that, apologies to those of you who have seen it, uh, is actually give you a teaser on how you can use pandas and how you can read in data with almost no hassle. Then uh, we are going to dive into the mathematics of linear regression, but we're also going to look a little bit at how we can uh, set up things using a library like scikit-learn. So scikit-learn is a very efficient library. It is well documented. Uh, really, the documentation is excellent. Now, the thing uh, I wanted to start with uh, before we move on is to show you an example of a data file. So in the uh, lecture material, if you go into uh, a folder which is called uh, machine learning doc and then look at the published for this week there are data files so this is a data file on uh, i don't know how far this is a domain specific it's a data file about uh, nuclear data it contains the number of protons the element type uh, number of neutrons and it contains the mass success which is an experimental quantity and then it translates into something called the binding energy so this is a typical example of a data file. This is actually a data file which is well structured. And what you can see now is that this is formatted and it has given columns. So what you can do now with pandas, just one line of code. You can actually extract the columns you want. So in this specific case, what I want is a, a specific column here. Uh, I want a column which contains things like the binding energy. I want this one. And I want to have a label in terms of A and N and Z and so on. So if you're not familiar with pandas, I really encourage you to actually start using it. And we will discuss these things at the lab. We discussed it at the lab yesterday and today. <coughs> but the, let me just show you this simple example. And I'm going to show you the Jupyter Notebook. So the Jupyter Notebook for this week is something which you also find. Uh, when you just download this file here. That's a Jupyter Notebook. And I will often be running these during the lectures. Now, uh, these pandas is an efficient way of dealing with uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional data. But I wanted to show you uh, the specific case here when you're reading the data. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details, but I just want to give you this as a kind of teaser before we dive into more of the mathematics of the methods. So pandas, you would typically introduce it like uh, you would have something like this in the beginning, import NumPy as NP and pandas as PD. I'm using scikit-learn as a library. 
But the important statement is me here defining objects, masses, where I now am filling in arrays, which contain column two in the data set, column three, four, six, and 11. And then I can give an index to these columns. And I need to specify because F here stands for formatted, this is a formatted file. So it needs to have a, because it's a file which was written with an old, with a Fortran program and it gives a formatted output. And so you need actually to dive into the data set and figure out what is what. But when you've done that, instead of you writing a code which reads this column, uh, creates this array, reads that column, creates that array, you just have one line, one line of code. And here, what you're doing now, you're filling in arrays. You will have one which contains the number of neutrons in this case, the number of protons, the total number of protons and neutrons, the element name, and also this energy, which I want to make a fit to using scikit -learn. And then you can do operations here. And you will also see that uh, uh, like in this specific file, uh, there will be not an entry. So there may not be an experimental point, And sometimes that is just left as a blank. So you have a functionality in Pandas, which is called drop NA. Uh, some people would put in by hand a value that happens. Sometimes you will see that the humans have punched in the wrong value. So you would have to correct the data file. So these are things, many of these things are done by humans, right? And that means that uh, there may be errors. And uh, you can then do mathematics with it. You can regroup the data set. So this can be the, the dominating quantity. I only keep the, well, those with the max value and then I'm ready to make a fit with scikit-learn. So you can see, the reason I show this is also that the first time I actually prepared this example was for a machine learning applied to nuclear physics. And there was a grad student from Texas A&M who got really frustrated because he almost got angry at his supervisor because he had spent two months reading that data file and writing a Fortran file to do the same thing which you hear doing one line. So that can be frustrating. And you see the easiness. When you have software like this, which makes your life easy, use it. And Pandas is a very efficient a way to deal with uh, uh, your data handling. It allows you to put labels and so on. So take a look at the examples. I'm not gonna repeat everything which is here in the, in the slides because we went through some of this during the lab uh, yesterday and today. <coughs> but I wanted to bring up uh, a small uh, example before we move on to the, uh, to, uh, the mathematics of linear regression. So this is a kind of simple teaser on how to use uh, scikit-learn as a basic library for some of the simpler, what I call low level machine learning methods like this, yeah. Okay, could you say it again? Yeah. Yeah. So you could have, uh, you, in this specific case, in this data set, you would actually need to make the arrays which you can transfer to scikit-learn, if I understood you correctly. So scikit-learn has a specific format it wants the arrays in. So if you have a, a vector with your inputs X, it actually wants that as a matrix of dimensionality, number of points times one. And you're gonna see that in the example here. So uh, this kind of uh, you massaging the data set is something you may have to do. Now, some of the data sets which we are going to study, scikit-learn has already prepared the data set for you. And then we can focus on the algorithm. Then in other cases, if you now in project number three would like to dive into a data set uh, of your own, it may happen that you would have to transform the data in one way or the other one. And if you're really unlucky, you may have cases where even a column which could represent velocity comes in different units 
because it was punched in at different times by different people. And we actually had a master student who wasted a month of uh, the thesis because we had units, wrong units on the data. One was in meters per second, another was kilometer per hour. And it took so, quite some time to figure that out. So the, uh, uh, the handling of the data itself, I mean, at the low level as we are doing in this course, Pandas does the job for you. Okay, so I wanted to give you a kind of small teaser. So this is a, an example here where we produce a vanilla data. So we produce an X, which is given by a uh, random distribution, a uniform distribution. We add some noise. And this noise, this N here, is normally distributed with a mean value zero and variance one. And you can see the definition. And we are going to have a model which runs like this. So we have an intercept. We want to make a plain linear model. We have an intercept, and then we have the slope, intercept alpha and the slope beta. These are the parameters. So we are not going to assess now. We just want to run the example. And then when we go into the mathematics of deep learning or linear regression, we are going to look at how we define these parameters alpha and beta. Now we're just going to use scikit-learn as a black box. So uh, if you want to do this, you see now, uh, and this is uh, related to the question here, you would actually have to transfer to scikit-learn an array, which is defined as a matrix of dimensionality 100 points times one. And then uh, we add some random noise here, and then we uh, define a function y, which is given by two times x. So a linear fit should be work well. You would import scikit-learn, the linear model, and that imports a, all the functionality in the linear regression module. And you see now when you use scikit-learn, uh, everything in a way is, becomes like a black box. You define this object, which inherits all the functionality in linear regression. And then the only thing you need to do is to fit. And then you can define a new set of X values and use the fit to make a prediction. So when you have defined this object and you make the fit, you have found these parameters alpha and the parameters beta, and then you can make a prediction. And that's it. So what we need to do now is actually to go into the mathematics behind what is taking place in uh, scikit-learn, because at, at the heart here, what we have is a matrix inversion, period. There's nothing more than that. And that's why this method is normally called a low-level machine learning method. And then if you run it, uh, what you would see now is something like this. Uh, we have lots of noise. So the circles are the data points which we created with lots of noise. And obviously a linear fit or a, just a first order polynomial is actually not impressive. If you now take away the noise, if you take away the noise here, just multiply that away, just comment, just comment it out, and you rerun it, you get a perfect fit. Now, by looking at the, the figure, I mean the, uh, the assessment by the eye, it, it looks pretty good, but we need something more formal to assess whether this is a good fit or not. And that's, so we made a model, if you now go back to what we discussed in the previous uh, lecture. So we have three basic elements. One, the data which created, the input X, the output Y. We created a model, a linear function, and now we want to assess it. So we need actually to figure out, is this a good model or not? Okay? So what we're going to look at now are the equations which we are going to derive in order to uh, perform this fit and assess whether this is a good model or not. So I'm going to switch. If you have, a, you have any questions uh, on this simple demonstration? OK, so the, um, <coughs> let's just switch back to the, uh, to the one. Can everybody see properly? So I'm going to use the whiteboard 
uh, during the lectures instead of the blackboard. And the reason for that is that this allows me to save the file. So you can view the file after the lectures if you want to. But it's also easier for those online because they cannot see properly the blackboard. So I hope you don't mind me doing the whiteboard instead of the blackboard. Okay. So uh, what we are going to have now, so what we dis have uh, defined is this uh, three steps in machine learning, which we need. So we need the data. In this specific case, what we have is uh, a vector y. And I'm not going to put arrows on top of it. It should appear from the context whether this is a vector or a matrix. And this contains our observations. And to stay in line with the standard Python indexing, which starts with the zero element, the zero element, I'm going to label the vector like this. So this is a vector y. And we are assuming that this is a real vector, real elements of length n. Then I have my data, my input data. So this is normally called the output. It has actually many different names in the literature, but I'm simply going to call this the output. And then we have the input. So then we have X, which is our input. Now X doesn't need to be a vector. X could be a matrix because we could have different features. So a typical example, which you will encounter is the example of the Wisconsin breast cancer data. And that has 30 features. So what you have done is a classification problem, whether you have a benign or malignant tumor. Yes, no, it's a typical binary case. And in that case, you have 30 features. So one is the uh, surface thickness, it's the uh, radius of the, of the tumor and so on. And these features are all used to classify whether this is a benign or not benign tumor. That means that you would have 30 columns in a matrix instead of a vector. So I'm coming back to this. And what we have now as input is a vector, as a plain vector. And this contains now our x0, x1, down to xn minus 1. And we're also assuming that these are real quantities. Then we made a model. This is the second part. And in our case, the model is going to be a polynomial fit. But let's, uh, before we set up the model, let's look at the data. So in linear regression and in regression and fitting problems, we are making an assumption. So this is my data and as a function of X, what we are assuming now is the following. And this is the basis of linear regression. We are assuming that there exists a function f of x. And then we are also assuming that there is a normal distributed noise. So I'm just going to write this as n normally distributed noise with zero mean and variance one. Sometimes you may know the noise. But the assumption now is that this y, this function y or this object y, is defined by a function f of x, which we don't know, but we assume it exists. And this is assumed to be a continuous function. And then there is a, a noise added to the data. And we may not know the noise, but this is the basic assumption. Now, what we are going to make then is a model. So in our case, this is our data. This is the input. And then when we have the data, we make a model now, which I'm going to label as a Y tilde of X. And you can make many different types of models. So what we are going to do now is to approximate this function F of X. So we can approximate that with a polynomial, P of X. So P as a polynomial of degree, we could say that is a degree D. It doesn't need to be the same 
have the same degree as the number of data points. And this is going to approximate the function f of x. Now, we are going to leave out the noise now and just assume that we can reproduce y with this y tilde. So let's write this p of d. So this is the model which we make. And in the lectures, in, in the Jupyter notebooks, we had a linear model, pretty simple. But this could be a polynomial of a given degree. So what we would have then would be a sum from i equals 0 up to d minus 1. And then we have some unknown parameters, beta of i. And then we have x. And now we are going to make a small change here. We are going to put a specific value x of j. And so we have x of j to the power of i. Is that, does that look like a polynomial? You guys agree with that? I haven't forgotten everything yet. Right? OK. So let's now just write this out. So what it means then is that we are going to have a model where we can now write x0, which we just write like y0, like that. And this is going to be equal to beta 0 plus x0 times beta 1 plus x0 times squared plus beta 2 plus, and this goes on up to x0 to the power of d minus 1 times beta of d minus 1. Then I can take the next one. So I have a y tilde, and that's going to be beta 0 plus x1 multiplied with beta 1 plus x1 squared times beta 2 plus plus plus. And this goes up to x1 of d minus 1 of beta of d minus 1. And this goes on all the way down to the last value of n minus 1. And this looks like a beta 0 plus xn minus 1 beta 1. And I just put plus plus here. Yeah? Say it again. So I have, a, a, I could put it up to D. I, I agree, but I normally I start with zero. So I do a polynomial degree D minus N. I have D points, which I use to fit the polynomial. So I have D parameters beta. So my beta now, if you look at beta, so I have D values. But my beta now, the unknown parameters, contain beta 0, beta 1, down to beta d minus 1. And this is now an element of R. So we have d elements. So since I start my numbering at 0, I fit it up to d minus 1. So this is just a choice of, of labeling, which I've done here. So I have d points. So it's a polynomial which contains d unknown parameters, and I start with 0. So 0 is going to be the intercept in this specific case. So if you think of a polynomial here. Did that help? Yeah, I think it's just a choice of mine, actually. Yeah. If you have uh, n points, you know that if you have n points, you can fit a polynomial of degree n minus 1. If you have two points, straight line. Three points, second order polynomial, four points, third order polynomial, and so on. So that's why I kept this minus one down. But I have D parameters, and I start my counting from zero. <coughs> now, if you look at what you have here, you can now define a matrix. So this X is what you have on the side here, is something you can rewrite in terms of a matrix times a vector. Does that sound reasonable? So I define the vector beta. So if I now define a matrix, so let's define this matrix X. So I should use an uppercase letter here. And this has 
element one because this is now multiplied with uh, the vector beta. Here I have x zero to the power of one, x zero to the power of two, and up to x zero to the power of d minus one. And here I would have x one to the power of one, x one to the power of two, and so on. And down here I have x n minus one. So this is n equals zero, n equals one, the second row, and this is n minus one the final row here. And this is to the power of 1. And then I get down to xn minus 1 to the power of d minus 1. Does that look OK? So what I'm doing now is simply to rewrite what I have as a matrix times a vector. So it means that when you look at these equations, you can rewrite this y tilde as this matrix x multiplied with a vector beta. So if you look at the dimensions now, we remember that this is a matrix which has dimensionality. It has n rows and d columns. This has is a vector of dimensionality d times 1. And this has dimensionality n times one. So you see now that when you perform the multiplication, you end up with the correct length for the vector y. <coughs> so this is a compact way of writing your uh, model. Now, this specific function is normally called the design matrix or the feature matrix. Design, feature, predictor matrix, and so on. So it has many names. So you can now think of every column as a specific feature. This column represents the first order part of the polynomial. The third column represents the second order part of the polynomial, and so on. So think of every column as a specific feature of your model. So we are going to represent all our data this way. So if you replace this with the cancer data, so the cancer data would have columns with, for instance, the, uh, the uh, circumference of a tumor, the thickness of a tumor. So this would be all data which are put in in each column. So each column represents a feature. Now, in our case, we are making the model. We are making the features. We don't have data. We're actually simply assuming now that we want to make a model which now contains a, a polynomial fit. Now, if I were to use all the data points instead of dimensionality, a matrix of dimensionality n times d, it would be a matrix of dimensionality n times n. Then it has a specific name in the literature. It's actually a Dutch mathematician who actually uh, came up with the name. Does anyone remember that name for that matrix? It's called Van der Monde matrix. So that's if you use all the data points which you have and then uh, use that to fit the polynomial. So if you have a polynomial of degree 100, you're making a fit of a polynomial of 200 data points. And then it's 100 times 100 matrix. Normally, what you will see is that this quantity in basically most of the machine learning applications, this quantity D is going to be much smaller. So normally, this D is much smaller than N. This is a little bit important because for the algorithms we're going to deal with, this means that we will often have matrices to invert, which are small. So a typical case, you may have uh, entries about 100,000 patients, that is N, and then you may have 30 features. And that means that the data you're going to handle, the matrix, matrix problem, is going to be a matrix problem defined by the number of features. So let's see how that comes through. 
So this is our model. What I've done now is simply to rephrase the model in terms of a matrix times a vector. So I should also add the naming to this. So these are the unknown parameters. to be determined. And this is where the optimization comes in. So what we need next now, in addition to the data, this is the third point. So that's a way to assess the quality of the model. And that leads to what we call the cost or the loss or the risk function or the error function, etc. And I'm going to write this in the following way. I'm going to call this for a C. That's a function which I haven't defined yet. This is a function which now has an output Y. And then I'm going to write it like a bar like this. And it has a parameter beta. And it has this matrix X which contains my input. So this function will also depend, so X and beta define my model Y Tinder, right? So what it says here, given X and beta, let's find uh, Y given X and beta. So what we are going to do now is actually to define a beta hat. So when I use a hat here, this is pretty common in statistics. This is the optimal value. So this is going to be given by a minimization problem. It's normally a minimization of all betas, which are now elements in this of, uh, of this of length of a of vector of length d of this function c or y of beta and x. This is my optimization problem. This essentially what it means is us having to take derivatives of uh, this uh, function with respect to the parameters beta. So practically what this leads to, and now I'm going to write this as a, in terms of uh, derivatives of a vector. So tomorrow we are going to look a little bit more about the mathematical expressions when you take derivatives of matrices and vectors. But now I'm just gonna state it. So what we need then is to take the derivative of this quantity, of y, of d, of beta, of x, with respect to beta. This is actually what we end up doing, and we require that that one is equal to zero. So that's the optimization problem, and that's why we need gradients, because this is a vector of uh, length d, and that means that we need uh, d derivatives. And we want to optimize the problem by taking these derivatives and driving them to zero. So let's now look at functions which we can use to assess the quality of the model. So which kind of function? Uh, let me now uh, give you one function which I really like. So let me now be a little bit sloppy as well and just give you an example. So let's put this C. And C, I just drop the uh, Y and X and beta, just for simplicity. I hope you can forgive me, right? So let's suppose C is given by the uh, relative error. So what I'm gonna do now is to define this. Now Y is a vector. So this is actually the absolute value of my data, the output minus the model. And then I divide by the absolute value of Y. So remember now that Y is actually given by a matrix times beta, okay? So what you have here is Y minus X times beta divided by Y. So this is one possible way to assess the quality of my model, right? So ideally, I want my relative error to go to zero. So the difference between my model and the output, I actually want that to be zero. 
then I have an hopefully an ideal fit. Now, if you now take derivatives, what kind of problems do you see with the relative error? Any good suggestions? If I take the derivative with respect to the parameter beta, let me give you a small hint. So if I have a function f of x, which is just given by the absolute value of x, and then I want to take d of f and d of x, Any good suggestions? Yeah, you have minus one if x is less than zero, and plus one if it's larger or equal to zero, right? So that becomes discontinuous. And you can do it, but often when you have a discontinuous functions, this complicates your numerics. And uh, uh, any kind of such discontinuity means that you have to plug in if tastes in your codes and you have no guarantee you actually have reached a minimum. So in this specific case, you would have minus one if x is less than zero, zero if x is equal to zero, and plus one if x is larger than zero. So typically, this is a function which can actually cause problems for us. So normally, when you calculate derivatives, since in machine learning, you are going to calculate derivatives zillions of times. Think of a neural network. You may have one million unknown parameters, or even more. So that means that you're going to calculate one million derivatives for every parameter to fit them. And you're going to do this many, many times. Then. Anything which leads to if tests or discontinuity is something you would like to avoid. Okay? So a function which normally is used is actually the so-called mean squared error. This is, the, is a function which gives us a continuous derivative and it guarantees that the function will be convex and we will have a global minimum. So the mean squared error is given by one over the number of data points which we have. And it contains a sum from i equals zero to n minus one of y of i minus the model y of i tilde squared. Now this is a quantity which puts an emphasis on outliers. So if you have a big differences, that's gonna magnify the mean squared error. So some people there's actually a cost function, which is called the Huber cost function, which contains the mean squared error plus the relative error. So you can do this different, uh, you can construct your own cost function depending on the data set which you have. But the mean squared error is actually the simplest possible cost function which we can deal with. So what we need to do now is to rewrite this. So we're gonna rewrite it in terms of one over n and then we have a sum i equals zero to n minus one. And now we have a y of i. And now we are going to bake in the uh, matrix. So in this specific case now, what we need to do is actually to set up the matrix times the vector multiplication. So we need to have a sum of j equal to zero up to d minus one. And then we need x i j multiplied with beta j squared. So this is the way we would now write it out in terms of the model which we have defined. Is everybody comfortable with this expression? So remember now that when you write this x times beta, this is a matrix. And the matrix x, we can write it in a more, how to say, generic way. This has matrix elements x0, 0, 0, x0, 1, x0, d minus 1, and then we have x1, 0, and down to x, n minus 1, 0, 
and then off to x n minus one of d minus one. That's just a matrix. And then when you multiply it with a given, uh, when you take a given row and multiply that with a vector, you would then rewrite that the way we are doing here. So is that everybody's comfortable with that? So I, I'm telling, I, I, maybe I'm, I hope I'm not offending you with going a little bit slowly forward here. But machine learning is essentially, at the end it boils down to you dealing with uh, tensors, matrices, vectors, and so on, at the end. So linear algebra and optimization are two of the main, uh, how to say, types of methods which we, or fields which we, fields which we end up using. So we can write it like that, but we can also write it in a more compact way. By the way, you will also see people dropping the one over n, that's pretty common. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the one over n because I want to link this later to expectation values and a statistical analysis. So this is actually going to be the expected value of this difference. So, or the expected value of the, the sample of the data which we have, because we don't have a probability distribution. I'm coming back to the difference between the true mean value and the sample mean value, or the true expected value when you have the probability distribution and the sample expected value. So this is something we will discuss a little bit more in depth next week. But now we just leave it like this, but you will see this expression with a one over n. Some people even leave one over n and they just divide by two because when you take the derivative, you get rid of the factor of two here. So you will see this in different disguises. But now we are ready to, to start doing the operations here. You can rewrite this in a more compact form, by the way. So that means that what we could do now, if you look at this, this is a scalar, right? And it's just two vectors. So if you, you can actually rewrite this equation in terms of one over n, and then you can rewrite it as a vector y minus the matrix x beta, which is also a vector transpose, times y minus x times beta. So this is also compact notation. Now, I invite you to tomorrow to just do the derivatives now with respect. Um, I'm just gonna give you the answer. But what you could do now, you can take this expression here and you can go through it explicitly and take the derivatives. So we can write dc d beta j equal to zero. So try it. Uh, till we meet tomorrow, I, I'm going to give you, I'm taking the liberty of giving you a small homework. You can do that. And then you would simply take the derivatives for each beta j here. Alternatively, you can look at the matrix. And tomorrow I'm going to give you some of the mathematical details of taking the derivatives with vectors and matrices. But I'm going to give you the answer here. So. I'm going to write the compact form so we can write it to dc of beta. I want that to to be zero. And this is going to be equal to minus one over n times two. And then I'm going to have the matrix x multiplied with y minus x times beta. So tomorrow, uh, I'm going to leave you guys in a suspension. It's like a TV series, right? I mean, you can't wait till we meet together tomorrow and get the final details. So I'm just going to give you the answer. So we want this to be zero. So two is a constant, n is a constant, none of them are zero. So it means simply that what I have now, uh, sorry, it should be transpose. I forgot that. So what we have is x transpose times y is equal x transpose times x times beta. And that means that beta 
the parameter and now I'm going to put a hat on it because this is my optimal parameter is going to be given by the inverse of this matrix multiplied with xt times y. So everything here is known. Same here. These are the outputs. This is the label data which somebody has given you. You know the values of these. You know the values of your x's. You know the matrix. So everything on the right hand side is known. So we have now a definition of the parameter beta, the unknown parameter, which optimizes the mean squared error. This is standard, the simplest variant of linear regression. So there's an immediate problem you see here. So what strikes you as a possible problem? Yeah? All right, my hearing is rotten. So when, when we do a polynomial fit, what normally happens then is that the different orders of the polynomial, they are orthogonal. So for the polynomial fit, this is a no stress problem because for the polynomial fit, you have almost a guarantee that the matrix will not, will be invertible. If you, however, have data sets which you have no idea about, you can have correlations between the features and that means that there can be dependencies among the column vectors, and then you can't invert the matrix. So that's a big problem. So next week, we are going to look at something which is called the singular value decomposition, which to me is one of the most beautiful linear algebra algorithms, which allows you to circumvent these problems with the near singular matrices to invert. But this is the basics. This is what Gauss and Laplace did back in the 1850s. Gauss actually also came up with his statistical interpretation. Actually, Gauss did everything. I mean, it's intimidating. There's nothing left for us to do, eh? So you see that name of Gauss popping up everywhere. Okay. I'm going to stop here. Right? I don't want to exceed time. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Things are unclear. Uh, tomorrow we're going to discuss more the mathematics of this, what it means, and uh, continue along with discussions of linear regression. So for those of you online, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. I hope, um, yeah, I, I didn't see the thing in the chat because I'm, I probably, I don't, I I actually have problems in, in following the chat as a teacher as well. <laughs>